Our honorable guest, Sri Harish Salve, Dr. Raman Mittal, professor in charge of Campus Law Center, Dr. Seema Singh, faculty convener of debate and discussion society of Campus Law Center, respected teachers, students, guests, and all the viewers and audience. A very warm welcome to the much awaited inaugural session of Courtroom Legends keynote series. I'm Kajal Sonkar, a final year student in Campus Law Center and currently heading the debate society with a fellow batchmate of mine, Mr. Vijay Pajari. On behalf of Campus Law Center and Debate Society, I thank you all and foremostly our honorable guest, Mr. Salve, for joining us today. Thank you, sir, for accommodating us in your busy schedule and gracing us with your esteemed presence, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Now, I would like to request Dr. Raman Mittal to please uh, address us with his welcome remarks. So we are extremely delighted that the Debates and Discussion Society of Campus Law Center has taken this wonderful initiative to organize a webinar by inviting Mr. Harish Salve, Queen's Counsel and former Solicitor General of India. It is my proud privilege to welcome you, sir. Indeed, the topic of the discussion is invigorating and provoking. It seeks to explore, are we true to the dreams of the makers of the constitution? This necessitates us to first know about the dreams which emerged in the collective consciousness of the makers of the constitution. In order to share my understanding of this extremely important theme, I would like to narrate a small anecdote. One day, a teacher came to his class with 100 pieces of cardboard, placed all those pieces on the table and said to all, look, this is the map of our country, but I have cut it into pieces and I have mixed all the pieces. Now anybody who is confident that he can put them in their right places and arrange the map, he or she should come up, come on the stage and arrange the map. One student came forward, he tried, but failed. Another tried, she also failed. One boy was watching five people, five of his fellow students fail in their effort to make the map complete and in order. Finally, he went and turned over all the cardboard pieces. The teacher said, what are you doing? He replied, please wait. I'm working it out. Five people have failed, but I've found the secret, the key. Let me do it. On the other side, when he turned over the cardboard pieces, on the other side of the map was a picture of man. He arranged the man, which was a much easier task to do. On one side, the map, on one side, the man, the face of man was arranged. And on the, on the other side, the whole map of the country was automatically arranged. This was the key that the little observant boy could discover. The teacher praised the little young boy for doing what he did, which others could not. Surely he was able to find the key. My dear friends, the key, the goal, the aspiration, the philosophy of the constitution has been handed over to us by the framers. We need to be smart enough, like that observant little boy, to recognize the constitutional key, which indeed is crucial for the welfare of all our brethren. I once again welcome you, sir, and thank you for agreeing to address the students and faculty of Campus Law Center. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, uh, Raman sir, for the thought-provoking story. Now, I would like to begin with the introduction of Campus Law Center in the Debate Society and the series. So Campus Law Center, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi, is the melting pot of academic excellence with brilliant students coming from all over India, representing a heterogeneous and diverse set of values, opinions, and ideas. When discussion is the ethos of, this, of the institution, we as a debate and discussion society become a natural facilitator of it. DDS has been on the forefront of imparting knowledge and awareness 
beyond the bounds of classroom education. Over the years, we have set stage for riveting debates, paths defining dialogues, and empowering discussions. And today, in the presence of Honorable Sri Harish Salve, we very proudly take our chain of initiatives a notch higher and inaugurate Courtroom Legends keynote series. This series is an experiment to get into the minds of stalwarts of the legal field who have dedicated their lifetime to it. These are the people who influence the flow of power. They unearth the unwritten soul from a statute. They are the master interpreters of law. While they speak here at a platform of Campus Law Center, for all the aspiring lawyers like us and my friends, they are a little more than that. They are shining examples of possibility and they are everything we hope to be one day. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself to be challenged, excited, and inspired all through the series, beginning today with none other than Mr. Harish Salve. Now, when I was assigned the task of introducing Mr. Salve, the very first question that came to my mind was how to introduce a man who needs no introduction at all, especially in a law college. A man who inspires millions of aspiring lawyers. This, uh, his everyday courtroom uh, experiences and crafts are taught as case laws in our classes. His impregnable courtroom genius overturned the impossible. No combination of words will ever be able to justify the might of Mr. Salve. But not every day a person like me gets to introduce Mr. Salve. So I, for one, am not going to let go of this indulgence. And I would like to go ahead with my introduction for Mr. Salve. As we all know, Mr. Salve is senior advocate, Queen's Council, a recipient of, uh, a recipient of Padma Bhushan, and former Solicitor General of India. Sir is well renowned for international commercial arbitration and litigation. He is a stalwart in constitutional law, environmental law, public international law, human rights, and taxation law. Although Sir has fought a plethora of cases, but to name a, a notable few, uh, Sir represented Kulbhushan Jadav at International Court of Justice. He represented Union of India in various cases. Uh, the popular ones that we all have read also in our classes in, is in the Italian Marines case, uh, Kaveri Water Dispute, Marshall Islands case. Over the years, Sir has brought significant changes in economic, commercial, environmental landscape of our country, while also redefining India's stance in public international law. We are honored and elated to have Mr. Salve to deliver the keynote on topic, 71 years of constitution, are we true to the dreams of its makers? Without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the legend himself, Mr. Harish Talve. Over to you, sir. You may have it. Professor Mittal, Dr. Seema Singh, Kajal, all other young colleagues, present and putative colleagues who are listening in friends i'm indeed honored to be here today speaking to all of you sharing a few ideas i always try and grab every opportunity that i can to speak to younger friends particularly from the law the world of law the law faculty and generally from universities because I feel the time has come. I have reached an age where we should now think in terms of handing over batons to the next generation. Our generation is all now 65 and thereabouts. We have a decade to go, but we have to prepare the next line to take over. And it's always very exciting to speak to all of you. I see in the present generation so many qualities which I must confess we did not see when we were in law faculty. I see a passion for law. I see a passion for public events. I see a passion for industry, for hard work, for learning. Of course, the 
information explosion, which we have today, courtesy uh, the internet, has put so much more material into your hands. But what fascinates me is your ability to ingest this huge information, to process it, and to keep all this going, to keep all this moving, is quite an achievement. And therefore, it's always, I find, very refreshing for me to interact with young friends, and that is why I will try and keep more time for the question answers and try and express my thoughts in that way a relatively shorter period of time. So have we lived the dream of our founding fathers? A fascinating question. And when we start deconstructing the issues, we should, in order to answer this question, we must start with a pledge. And the pledge is not to question, not to criticize, not to condemn what the past generations have achieved. Any such debate is an exercise in stock taking. How far have we come? What are the distance, distances we have covered and how much more distance needs to be covered? Where is it that we have emerged strong? Where is it that we have faltered? And it is this time to time stock taking which helps us in strengthening our strengths and removing our weaknesses, which in the ultimate analysis is the process of every democracy, because we have to start by accepting that democracy is a process. It's an ongoing exercise. It is, as Mr. Palkewala used to say, a ceaseless endeavor. Democracy is a state of mind. And democracy is a state of spirit. And therefore, there will always be areas where you achieve and areas where you don't. And so any such debate should not be a debate of condemnation or criticism. It should be a debate of stock taking. With that spirit, let's try and deconstruct how far have we lived the dream? How true have we been to the dream? To answer that, we have to first articulate our understanding of what was the dream. And I think the most pithy articulation of the dream of the Founding Fathers is in the preamble to the Indian Constitution. Let me clarify, when I say the preamble to the institution, Indian Constitution, I mean the unsullied preamble as it stood before the attempt to defile it in 1976 by the 42nd Amendment. I'm a trenchant critic of what was added to the preamble, and I think it deserves to be ignored. Because that was not the dream of our founding fathers. That was the dream of a part of a transient political system. So what is that dream? That dream was to establish, to constitute a sovereign democratic republic. And by establishing a sovereign democratic republic, the founding fathers dreamed that 
those who ran the country would secure to its citizens justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, of expression, of belief, faith and worship, equality of status and of opportunity. and to promote amongst all of us fraternity and this is i think a very important area which we should start focusing upon a sense of fraternity which ensures to us the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation how far in 2021 seven decades plus have we lived this dream? Our constitution is a work of genius. And this was the first dream of the founding fathers. That the dream would not end on 26th of January 1950. The dream began on 26th of this January 1950. They wanted each one of us to dream and to live the dream. This, our constitution, Granville Austin always says it's a dustbin of a constitution, it has too many provisions. <laughs> but our constitution was written in some detail because the founding fathers knew that not just democracy, but let's remind ourselves, India was an experiment. There was no India until we all, all our princely states, or most of our princely, big princely states, fail to defend themselves against the British takeover, the Portuguese takeover. The Dutch influence in uh, Kerala and so on. It's a matter of history that it is the British who stitched together the princely states for their own convenience and then pulled the plug on us when they enacted the Indian Independence Act by restoring sovereignty to all the princes and the first home minister of india sardar patel and his team stitched together india so india itself was an experiment how would we function as a unit itself was the first dream of our founding fathers recognizing that no constitution can be rigid and should have within it the power to correct course from time to time they created the amending power It was a power given in trust and we have seen that trust being abused on many occasions. One of the fortunately least significant but most telling abuse of the amending power was to tinker with the preamble. They put in provisions which would enable the government to shrink for defined periods, the freedoms of citizens in case of emergencies. We have seen how that power is abused. The darkest period of the Indian constitution, and which according to me was an inflection point in the dream that we have lived, was 1975 to 1977. It was not just emergency, it was the capitulation of all institutions, including our great Supreme Court.
the Shivkan Shukla judgment in my 40 plus years at the bar, I have never cited. It has so many legal propositions, never cited. I have only seen one attempt by some colleague tried to cite that judgment, and the judges said, don't show us that judgment. He said, it's an important point. He said, don't show us the judgment, show us any other. That's not a judgment which deserves to be cited. So it was the darkest period, capitulation of parliament, capitulation of, of the executive, the civil service collapsed, the Supreme Court collapsed. We start by always reminding ourselves, therefore, that democracy is a very fragile virtue. So we have created for ourselves a sovereign democratic republic. But we have to remember that we have to continue to be careful that we retain democracy in its strengthened form and never again should we ever allow the kind of aberrations that took place in 75, 77. But I think it's a matter of great pride that in 1977, uh, 19, uh, in 2021, 20, 71 years down, the only instance where I can say that the constitution completely was distorted is 1975 to 1977. So I think there is a positive way of looking at this. So where have we succeeded then? We have succeeded in holding together, first of all, our democracy. We have changed governments over and over and over again. The first major change of government came in 1977 and thereafter 1980, 1989, 91 and so on and on the governments changed with the ballot. That's a great strength. There was an interesting article I was reading by in the context of Myanmar somebody had written and he had said that why are we so shocked at what is going on in Myanmar? Because in the 20th and 21st century, a coup d'etat has a well-documented phenomena in Southeast Asia. Look around us. See what keeps happening in Sri Lanka. See what keeps happening in Bangladesh. See what keeps happening north of our, uh, west of our border in Pakistan. And so on. China doesn't even pretend to be a democracy. So in this Southeast Asian bloc, we are an island of democracy. I think that's a huge success. But for those two dark years of 75 to 77, we have successfully worked ourselves as a sovereign democratic republic. Yes, we have challenges to overcome. Our biggest challenge and the biggest threat to democracy comes not from communalism, not from casteism, comes from poverty. We have done a good job. The 2019 Global Multidimensional Poverty Index report by United Nations now recognizes that 273 million Indians have come above the BPL. That's roughly 21% of our population. We have succeeded in a life expectancy which matches that of developed countries, 70 plus years. But we have unfortunately failed in curbing infant mortality. So we have a distance to cover. We have our limitations. We have 2% of the world's landmass and nearly 18% of the world's population. 
So when we talk in India of removing poverty and creating jobs, India has to measure jobs per square meter. With this challenge, we have held together for these decades, therefore, is the first tribute to India of having lived the dream of our founding fathers. Democracy itself and the notions of democracy itself is not static, but the notion has evolved. We now talk of participatory democracy. The other day I was reading a very nice, very interesting paper by Professor Lawrence Bearer of University of Montreal. He calls, he was, he talks of participatory democracy, of how relationship between citizens and power is shaped or reshaped through participatory practices. What does it mean to participate from the perspective of citizen building? And what types of citizens emerge and thrive in this participatory process? Participatory democracy is becoming more and more feasible, even in countries as diverse and as vast population-wise as ours, thanks to the social media. In fact, a report which had been commissioned by the European Union eight years ago spoke of social media and social networking tools being the bridge between civil society and the European Union. And we have seen how that has helped people influence government. So even the phrase sovereign democratic republic has two dimensions, democratic and republic. Sovereign, of course, we are. What is a republic? By the people, for the people, of the people. How far have we achieved that? And I'm going to challenge the notion of saying we have achieved a lot in that area. I'm going to challenge that notion by saying no. That is one area where we have a lot of work to do. We must do some soul searching and we must admit to ourselves that there is a feudal hangover which we in India suffer. People who get elected to positions of power immediately become heady. And we, it, it, it's a, it, it, it is a phenomenon which is going down, I start by saying, but the fact is we do succumb to the temptation of deifying and of being overly obsequious at times to those in power. You have to see in other parts of the world how people talk to ministers, straight look in the eye. The Lal Bhakti culture is still yet to go. I tried my bit, it has improved. The Lal Bhakti culture still has to go. Why was, what was the need of the Lal Bhakti? It was for the British officers to move the natives to one side. I think it's an insult to the Republic to have the Lal Bhakti today. So yes, how far have we emerged as a Republic? And for that, you do not need a court. You do not need Judges, you do not need lawyers. What you need is spirit. We have to accept that we are a republic. We have to accept that civil servants are what their name defines, servants. Civil servants are here to govern. Civil servants are here to serve. They are not here to rule. And the day 
we change our mind, the civil servants, the political executive, and all those in power will realize that we, the citizens of India, we, the people of India, are asserting that we are a republic. Justice, economic, social, political is one front, I think, where we can be fairly proud of what we have achieved. Of course, nobody is ever satisfied with the state of society and never should be. A society in which there is too much calm is a society which shows decay setting in. There must always be noise. There must always be voices raised against injustice. Because justice can never be fully and perfectly achieved. Until you keep stirring the pot, till you keep protesting against the injustices which you see, you are not serving the cause of justice. But if you step back, and look at where we are today. What is the degree of empowerment that we have brought in? I think we can justifiably be proud of ourselves with the kind of poverty with which we are plagued, with the kind of infrastructure limitation that we have had. And worse, with the kind of politicization of the process of achievement of justice. Keep people poor and keep promising to remove their poverty. Keep people unequal and keep promising to bring them equality. Keep people denied of justice and keep promising to deliver justice. This cycle has now been broken. And I think people have realized that they must reach out and claim justice. And that is, I am so proud of the noise I hear in India, because that shows we have, if you stand back and say, have we achieved justice? Well, we are well on the path to changing systems, to improve the quality of social, economic, and political justice in India. Look at our prime minister, where does he come from? Look at our previous Prime Minister, where did he come from? Look at so many Chief Ministers, where did they come from? People from humble beginnings are in high position today. Is that not empowerment? India was governed for the longest period ever by a female Prime Minister. Is that not empowerment? Look at the Dalit classes. See how today the political system responds to their demands. Is that not empowerment? So we have, by process of empowerment, achieved a degree of justice. Liberty of thought, liberty of expression, belief, faith, and worship is something which your generation takes for granted, my generation takes for granted. But when you see others, other countries, you realize how much we have achieved. The liberty of thought, expression, belief, your generation has, will hopefully never see it. My generation saw it. The censors red pencil between 1975 and 1977. stifling speech and no political system after that has ever had the courage to attempt any such misadventure. So the liberty of thought, expression, faith and belief, the liberty of worship, the equality of status and opportunity, economic opportunity can never ever be all social systems have failed. 
But what we have achieved is remarkable. We, despite our challenges, have kept the flag of democracy flying. And we have, at least in law, strived to create equality of status, be it gender justice, be it the rights of disabled people, be it the rights of the, of the disadvantaged classes. We have achieved at least a state of mind where there is a constant effort to improve the quality of equality. And I think that by itself is very important. Fraternity. How far have we come living the dream of fraternity? And that is where I feel we need to remind ourselves that our constitution spoke of assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of India. One cannot be at the cost of the other. I do realize that there is a lot of anger over perceived injustices, over perceived failure to achieve the ideals of justice and equality. But the dream of our constitution makers was that we would achieve all this while remaining a sovereign democratic republic, which also assures to all of us fraternity, the dignity of the individual and the unity of the country. And there are moments where you throw up your hands and say, is India really a idea which has worked? At your age, I have questioned the idea of India. At the age of near 65, I say India is an idea which is working very well. We have a lot of distance to cover. There is a lot of heartache. But we have a distance to cover. Creation of institutions is an important part of democracy. And that is where lies the biggest concern. We have created an independent judiciary. But the problem of the edifices that of the three pillars, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, a lot of disproportionate load has come on the third pillar, the judiciary. The way parliament has worked leaves a lot to be desired. And I think we need to get the debates back in parliament rather than outside parliament. We, as the people of India, have to tell those in Parliament that we vote for them, for them to go inside the House and debate, and not walk out of the House to enjoy subsidized coffee and snacks, or to stand outside the House and shout slogans. Whatever issues they have, they must take them in the House and debate them, and the House must work. What happens is, one of Parliament's biggest functions, holding the executive to account, suffers. Parliament's duty to make laws suffers. Politics is good, but the institution of Parliament is more important than the politics. And we have to strengthen that institution. Civil service. Civil service has to be independent of its political masters. Of course, they have to carry out the policy framed by the political masters, but they have to be independent. The police, as a part of the civil service, has to regain its independence. The criminal investigation wings have to regain their identity and independence. It worries me when I see the crumbling edifice of the civil service. And when I say civil service, I mean all the services other than the armed forces. I include in it the police. 
the rule of law can never be a reality if you do not have an independent civil service who is willing to stand up and enforce the law rather than be happy to receive and execute unlawful orders. Having said so, where are we then at the end of this discussion? We remind ourselves that democracy is work in progress. And democracy is always a process which keeps society changing. In fact, the important part of democracy, the important part of a political society is it keeps adapting, it keeps changing, it keeps evolving. So democracy is work in progress. Democracy is a journey. Democracy is an endeavor. And we have to be on the grind. We have to be on the wheel. We have to keep moving ahead. We have to keep repairing what needs repair. Despair is inevitable, but repair is the solution, not dismay. And remember, in, at the end, what did the Founding Fathers give you? What was their dream? Their dream was that each one of us would have the right to dream. Each one of us would have the right to dream our own dreams. Each one of us would have the right to have our own beliefs, our own faiths, and would have the opportunity to chase our dreams. So I close by saying, let us continue to dream this dream. Let us find wherever we find we can and dream of ways of getting better. The constitution makers had a beautiful vision. Their dream was a beautiful vision. Let us use their dream to fashion our dreams and continue to build a strong, sovereign, democratic republic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was a thought-provoking session for us, sir. And the uh, last one hour is not a quantity of time for us. It is perhaps an experience that we we'll cherish and keep for the rest of our lives. And uh, I am Vijay Pujari, sir. I am the student of Campus Law Center, a fine year student of law, and the convener of the Debate and Discussion Society. Before we open the floor for the public questions, uh, we start with a few questions that we have sourced out from public, and uh, we have got it. Sir, uh, in your illustrious career as an advocate, as a uh, Solicitor General of India, you may have represented multiple people. And how is it different? Uh, how a legal case is different when you have 1.3 billion people counting on you. I am uh, particularly referring to the Jadav case, uh, where you have uh, almost 1.3 billion people were counting on you and when you were representing India over there. Believe me, it was the idea that I would represent India was so empowering. And the relief after the case got over was so overwhelming. But those moments, the last seven days leading up to the hearing, and those four days of hearing, have reaffirmed to me that there is a God above to help me get past those days. That was the kind of pressure. You realize you're carrying the hopes and aspirations of people. You realize the limitations you realize you are being provoked and there were a lot of very provocative things said and the and the challenge was not rising to the bait but crushing the bait so yes it it was a it was, it was a very difficult moment i will not try and pretend it all happened easy or we breezed through it but it gave me great strength to think and I must say this publicly, I mean, the government was 100% behind me. Nobody was asking questions. And the kind of faith which 
the people of India and the government of India had in me gave me tremendous strength. So that made things much easier. So you have been a critic of the 42nd Amendment. And uh, by for whatever reason it is, we have to live with that word secular in the preamble. Uh, looking for 40 years uh, ahead of that moment, how do we carry that word secular in, in the preamble and how relevant it is in the present day and age? Well, uh, speaking for myself, uh, secularism is a very ambiguous word. It has different connotations to different people. I had, I remember reading Mr. Palkiwala's speech when he criticized and he gave three reasons. First of all, the preamble is a historical declaration of the founding fathers. So I don't think any of us have a right to amend it. We, the people of India, have formed a democracy, a sovereign democratic republic. And it only says, in our constituent assembly, we therefore give to ourselves this constitution. And we say we give to ourselves the power to amend the constitution. It was a historical fact. The preamble is a historical fact, and it copied, it, it sets out the dream. If you read the constituent assembly debates, it became very obvious what the meaning of secularism was. And I will just tell you an uh, instance, because I had the privilege of assisting the 11th judge bench in TMFI. And we had researched all this. And the question was, does, was the government stance that they would not, uh, the, that the uh, colleges which got government aid could not make reservations based on communal lines, was, was that a communal stance of the government? And for that purpose, I had researched everything. And I found there was a very senior Muslim member of the Constituent Assembly. He was so old that they used to give him permission to sit and speak. And he said, we have to create a secular republic. You must have a provision in the constitution that no person is entitled to wear a dress which identifies himself with his religion. And he was, he, he was, a very, he was an Islamic scholar. And he says, I know my community will dress themselves in a way by which they will identify themselves. And Ambedkar said, no. My definition of secular is each one has a right to live in his own identity. Who was right? They were both right. So that is why the framers of the constitution did not put the word secular in. Sovereign, we understand. Democratic, we understand. Republic, we understand. Secularism, you, your definitions in secularism may genuinely differ from my definition of secularism. And that is why, to put, and socialism, what is socialism? Socialism is, is an economic thought. You don't write a constitution for a country putting in an economic thought. Our part four of our constitution, the directive principles of state policy, mandate the creation of a welfare state, even if you have a, a, a free, uh, what is called a free, uh, free economy style. Your directive principles would still remain. The government's job would still be there to create a welfare state. Why put socialists there? That is my reason why I criticize this preamble. And well, it is there. Those words are there. I choose to ignore them every time I read the preamble. Like today, I ignored them when I read the preamble. Sir, so, uh, you've started your practice at the bar uh, during uh, almost when the uh, emergency was at the was its fag end. And uh, if my memory serves me right, uh, you started your practice uh, at Mr. Palkiwala and subsequently joined Mr. Sarabji. How different uh, in the course of uh, your practice, what was the role played by Mr. Palkiwala and Mr. Sarabji? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I must tell you, when um, I had just uh, passed, when I was in college, Mr. Palkewala came to Nagpur to give a speech. That time, the 42nd Amendment debate was going on. And Mr. Palkewala was going around the country giving speeches, saying why we should not have the 42nd Amendment. And uh, as I was leaving, 
uh, some friends. We he's looked at me. He's he used to know my father very well. Put his arm around me and said, "So Harish, when are you joining the bar?" The die was cast. My father wanted me to be an accountant, but I said, "No, Mr. Palkhel has asked me to join the bar." So the, that die was cast. I started interning with Dadachanji and company. That's where I got chance to work with Mr. Palkhewala in Minerva Mills and then one or two other cases. And then he told me, he says, you need somebody who's in day-to-day -day practice. And he called up Mr. Sorabji and said, you must take this youngster in your chamber. Mr. Sorabji had grave misgivings because my father was in the, in the Congress party. And, you know, Mr. Sorabji was a trenchant critic. So he told him, don't worry, Arish's political views are very different from his father's. You'll be happy to take him in your chamber. And Soli and I had the most lovely, it, it was almost like a paternal relationship, which Soli and I developed over the years. We loved our law, but we loved jazz. We loved each other. It, it was a beautiful relationship. So as a student of economics, I am compelled to ask this question. Uh, although this is not part of anyone's question, this is my personal question. Sure. Uh, as a student of economics, uh, we were always told the part three was pitched against the part four. And development and uh, some kind of fortune and money, the, the fact that a person is earning money is taboo. Uh, is it the constitutional value that the makers wanted to carry? Were we innately a socialist nation or a nation that is keeping poor and passing uh, fortune to the poor? You know, one of the greatest things about Indians is our drive and our power of innovation. And I was really surprised five years back when I heard a lecture in Oxford University on economics, where they were saying, why is it that when the world is in a meltdown, post Lehman Brothers, why is it India is not in a meltdown? And you know, in the strength of India's informal economy. The Oxford economists who had done years of research on the ground in India, he said, he says, the Indians' innate sense of industry is so huge. And then he said, I learned one word in India. It's called Jugaad. <laughs> Indians find a solution for every problem. And when we had socialism thrown at us, we found a solution. We broke the back of socialism. So the Indian has within him a natural drive to create, to achieve, to attain. Such people can't be chained in a socialist society. You know, equality of opportunity is a very challenging subject. And the government has to create a baseline from where everybody gets a good chance to go ahead in life. But that's a debate for another day. But beyond that, to say that profit is a bad word is silly. Let me tell you why, because you've asked this question. Let me tell you why I say so. The world has changed today. Profit was a bad word where the profit was earned by promoters who came from feudal families. But profit by a person and a profit by an institution are two very different things. Today, who owns these giant companies? The answer is nobody owns these giant companies. Forget the one Facebook or the one uh, Amazon. Again, created by young students, but which have just gained traction. Who owns these giant companies? Private equity funds? Whose money does private equity handle? Pensioners? Middle class people? Not just high net when it was individuals. So ultimately, in one sense, it's a socialist society. And do you know the most ruthless form of management? is by companies which are run by private equity funds. Because if you have the middle class man's money, you owe him a return. To owe him a return, you will run your company with ruthless efficiency. So the whole notion of socialism has to be revisited in the context of today's economic structure and today's economic society. And I think socialism is, as, as a welfare state, of course, a welfare state is a must. The government must tax, must raise resources, and must make baseline available to uh, available to everybody so they have equality of opportunity. 
But to say beyond that profit is a bad word is something I don't believe. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have Charvi Virmani, a colleague of mine, and the first year student of law. Uh, she has a question for you, sir. Good day, sir. My name is Charvi Virmani. I'm a first year student of the CLC. Yes. So I have a question regarding reservation. So the constitution makers had a vision to upgrade each and every street of the society. The concept of reservation was brought about to ensure upliftment of the ones who were historically deprived. So is reservation today relevant enough to ensure upliftment as a tool? Is it relevant enough today to ensure upliftment? Or is it rather being a discouragement for our young brains to leave India? And also, is reservation today being used and carried out for its true purpose? Or is it being used as a tool of peace? That's, that's my question. Before asking this question, is it that you have some uh, inside information about my views in the matter? <laughs> because I have, I have I have always been a staunch critic of the way a reservation is used. I have appeared in all these a lot of these cases, including pro bono, challenging a reservation. The reason is as follows. A reservation was necessary where a government job gave you status. Back in the day when British were ruling India, people would crave a British job because working for the company gave you status. After which getting a government job gave you status. So reservation was to change the social status of the backward classes. You know our society's problem. You would not talk to somebody who's a backward class person. You would not share a meal with somebody who's a backward class person. I have seen when as a 14 year old, I went with my father. He was a member of parliament. He had to go into a little tribal village to inaugurate a well. Because the district collector said the people there are not allowing one group of people to come and drink water from that well because they are backward classes. That is what reservation was meant to destroy. To a large extent, we have destroyed them. The reservation was not an economic reservation. It, it was equality of status. And when you talk of economics today, I think government jobs themselves are becoming not as important because with the explosion in private sector and with the government accepting that growth now has to come, you cannot go on adding jobs at the cost of the taxpayer and because you're creating disguised unemployment. Jobs have to come where there is creation of wealth. And that can only now come through private sector. So reservation as an economic measure is never what has been targeted. Today, reservation is neither an economic nor a status measure. It's a political measure. And that, according to me, has been the biggest one of the biggest failings. I mentioned in my uh, speech about people who have created the cycle Keep people out of justice and promise them justice. Keep people poor and promise them removal of property. Keep people unequal and promise them removal of equality. Reservation is one of those which is used in the cycle. Keep telling people how terrible they are and say, I will remove it by giving you more reservation. So according to me, reservation is something which needs a rethink. But at least in my lifetime, I don't see the Indian political system ever getting ready for a free and frank debate on reservation. You promote me to say this and I say it. Thank you, sir. So we have Shishir Kumar Rai, also a first year student, a fresher who joined us recently. Uh, he has a question. Please go. Uh, very good afternoon to you, sir. So my question is regarding from a uh, right to freedom of speech and expression. So how large in your opinion is the scope of word reasonable restriction that is mentioned in uh, Article 19, clause 2, over the right of speech and expression mentioned in uh, Article 19, 1A? What is the balance that you see that the constitution envisions between the two? Uh, can it be used to actually curtail down uh, even a small change, uh, uh, abrasion in exercise, even a small abrasion exercise of the right, or it should be only used in very serious threats to the society? I think there is one principle, and I have argued for it 
in one two cases it has not been accepted but to some extent has been accepted in 191a the principle of reasonable restriction or which is now on a broader canvas called the doctrine of proportionality which is built into our constitution remind ourselves of what uh, 1950 the supreme court said would a lesser restriction not survive so that is doctrine of proportionality for compel for curtailing speech it has to be compelling state need criticism never destroys society ill-advised criticism never destroys society intemperate criticism hard words don't destroy society where speech becomes a part of a movement coupled with physical action etc where you get into a compelling state need where genuinely not not for argument's sake but genuinely the fraternity is threatened the unity of the country is threatened then there may be areas where you may for small periods of time have to curtail speech according to me it has to be compelling state need very very narrowly and strictly construed and no more so a colleague of mine uh, mr tiwari has a question for you he says uh, he asks in fact do you see fundamental duties being imposed on citizens of this country any time Fundamental duties are a state of mind. Each one of us has to be educated to understand how important it is for us to do our bit to preserve what we have. That is what fundamental duties have that is how fundamental duties have to be enforced through education not through fiat and i hope no government ever tries imposing fundamental duties through fiat in switzerland for example you know it's very interesting in switzerland you go they say every swiss national is a soldier every citizen is a soldier that's their spirit that is what you have to inculcate. Each one of us has to be a soldier of democracy, not a victim or a, or a person who is commanded by law to do something. It must come from our heart. And that can only come by educating people into the need for preserving democracy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have Shreya Sethi asking a question. Shreya. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, please How ask. much does safeguarding of human rights play an important role in keeping dream of a constitution makers true? If you ask me of what is the most important part of our constitution, I would say it is the Golden Triangle, 14, 19, 21. That's the heart and soul of our constitution. And it's only in conditions of freedom that the human spirit can grow. So I think the day we sacrifice even a scintilla of our freedoms, we should delete the word democratic from our preamble. That's how important freedoms are. Thank you. Thanks. Sir, I'm a student, first year student from the Government Law College, Nagpur, and a chartered accountancy student. Sir, 10 years ago, you had uh, given an interview with my law, and you had talked about uh, the quality of law schools, including yours and about the national law schools, and how the bar is supporting young members joining the legal fraternity. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes. We have uh, a national law school that are doing a wonderful job. And uh, we have to uh, do a lot of uh, work to repair and improve the quality of legal education. There is something that I can share with you, which I'm working with. There is a strong move to open Indian legal practice to the international world. And there is much 
nonsense which is being spoken about, oh, you will have foreign lawyers flooding India. Believe me, no foreign lawyer wants to come and appear in an Indian court. It is really a handful of Indian firms which are blocking foreign firms from coming in so that they don't lose their track practice. But what I've been working with foreign firms is that if you really want to practice in India, you must get bright Indian lawyers to come and intern with you in London, in New York, in Washington, in Singapore, and make international lawyers. We have to take now the next step and make, make our lawyers international lawyers. So this is an ongoing process, and I hope uh, you will continue to move ahead in the right direction. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, Aishwarya Garola has a question. How different is the practice in UK to that of India? And you've been doing both. Believe me, it's very, very different. The law is the same, but the practice is very different. Here, the quantity of work is one-fifth or one-sixth or one-tenth of what you do there. The quality is far more intense. You take a case, you have to be completely prepared, thoroughly prepared, fully researched, fully ready. And I have learned so much of sense of detail of what you write, of what you say, of how you prepare. So it's, it's, it's been a great learning experience for me. And it's very different the way you prepare a case here, the way you present a case here. It's wonderful. And I think there is a lot we can learn from this system. I'll take the question, sir. A Washington-based think tank, Freedom House, has reclassified India as partly free or free saying, uh, I'm sorry, as partly free from free saying rights and civil liberties have been constantly eroding. With this, India has reportedly been stifling the voice of democracy when it comes to the use of sedition law charges being slapped with low conviction rate. How do we as an aware citizen of India keep our consciousness of democracy alive to ensure that the idea of India continues to solidify with the passage of time. When an American newspaper writes this, I told them, first of all, why don't you go and analyze what happened on Capitol Hill? And why don't you go and analyze what Donald Trump was doing to your country? Why well, leave, leave India alone. We're doing quite well. Thank you. But let me tell you, I was asked exactly this question. What do you say about the high number of sedition cases and the low conviction rate? And I told them, will you please give me a list of the sedition cases which have been filed? Are they in the hundreds? No. Are they in the tens? Maybe. A lot of them are filed by uh, lay people who have strong views and go and file cases. How often is it? Not much. And even if a case is filed, look at the way the district judge passed that stinging order in uh, that young lady's case. Where is the question of democracy being put on fire? You have a robust judicial system. And despite all the uh, uh, might of the Delhi police, she got bail in three days. In a case where there was maybe something to be argued, maybe the bail has continued, not continued. So, you know, when people from America try and tell us about freedoms, I only remind them, what did you do to that Indian diplomat who, who you uh, blamed for uh, not paying full wage, took her into a police station and cavity searched her? So, you know, when Americans start talking about democracy, you tell them it's, it's time they concentrated on themselves and set their own house in order. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one from Govind Gupta, first year student. Uh, Govind, please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so my question is that uh, in last 71 years, constitution has already been 104 times amended. And like be as you said, be it uh, politically motivated reasons or be it the need of the changing times. So uh, how does the judiciary see this kind of a challenge? And the mammoth amount of litigation that is arising out of it, uh, where there are hundreds and thousands of cases pending already. So how does the judiciary find it? The judiciary rose to the occasion in Keswan and Bharti where they read in limitations and in Minerva Mills where they struck down the offensive parts of the 42nd Amendment. Beyond that, constitution amendments have not generated that volume of litigation. 
what has generated the volume of litigation is partly the delays in our system see i'll tell you in uk a, a civil trial they say is running really really slow because they are taking them one year it's taking them one year to finish a case in india you you, you barely as they say you barely finish warming up in one year so you know when cases are going to take that long then everything becomes so long i'll tell you when we were young lawyers in 19 late 70s if you wanted to argue for appointment of a receiver they heard everybody for 15 minutes on each side and said all right we'll set the suit down for hearing when you started arguing whether to grant leave to defend or not leave to defend chagla used to say i'll grant you leave to defend either you give up the money he said no i can't i have a technical point is all right put the sword uh, put the suit at the end of my board he put it at the end of his board you know in, in two weeks time your suit would reach for hearing so the dishonest defendant would say all right all right i will deposit so much and you know we'll settle the case today you fight for a leave to defend is argued for one and a half days in supreme court after being argued for 6 days before a division bench and 5 days before a single judge the courts don't have time to get to the cases so this delay creates delay and we have to and if you ask me we need a radical solution for delay in our judiciary left to myself i would multiply judicial salaries by 5 the reason i am telling you is today there are in selection processes into the judicial service you will find there are vacancies youngsters are not showing up in numbers how many of you would tomorrow happily take up a district judge's job you think twice so we have to improve we have to make it an attractive service see once a district judge 90% chances are you will go from junior grade district judge to senior grade district judge and retire or maybe 3 years at the end of your life high court you join as a collector and you retire as a cabinet secretary there is such huge movement life keeps moving from state to center center to state once a district judge always a district judge for most purposes make it at least more attractive so you know until we rethink that and we have more judges per million and we speed up our system and always remind ourselves who is the single largest litigant in india government of india so until we fix all this 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 volume of cases problem is not going to get resolved all right thank you sir so one last question from you uh, and this is something that everybody has asked me to ask you all the final year students so as a final year student uh, we would like to ask what all qualities we should imbibe or inculcate in ourselves to be uh, a decent lawyer or maybe to become go on the road of becoming a courtroom legend like yeah. yourself the uh, what makes a good lawyer are three or four basic qualities your ability to go without sleep your ability to sacrifice your social life your ability to sit and work for hours and hours on dry boring stuff and most of all your ability to think clearly always think clearly always try and think on straight lines and always be as a lawyer always be a dreamer thank you sir thanks a lot and thank you for being so patient and cooperative with all of us and with our questions and uh, uh, with this i also thank vijay for moderating this q and a session and uh, i would now like to request dr seema singh uh to please uh, address us with the whole world of thank you so much sir thank you it was uh, it is my proud privilege to propose this vote of thanks to mr harish salve who is a court room legend it was very insightful lecture sir touching almost all aspects of preamble of the indian constitution democracy is an ongoing process and constitution is a <laughs> spirit to live we have given this constitution to ourselves so it is our collective responsibility to work together to bring the dreams of constitution makers a reality with this i extend a big thanks to you once again from the entire dds and clc family 
to accept our invite and to deliver a very thought provoking inaugural keynote address for our courtroom legend series we are looking forward for such more interesting interacting and learning sessions from your great, great wisdom and experience thanks to you sir thank you so much once again and we will we will invite you again to learn more and more from you thank always you always a pleasure